flexion contractures of the PIP joints of the fingers are one of the most difficult problems we hand surgeons face. All flexion contractures are a result of an imbalance of forces across the joint. Either there's too much flexor force or not enough extensor force or a combination of the two. Secondary to these force imbalances, the PIP joint moves into a flex position. The soft tissues on the palm side of the joint and the capsules of the joint itself shorten. On the extensor side, the skin lengthens and unfortunately with time, the central slip itself of the extensor mechanism lengthens and becomes progressively incompetent to extend an otherwise healthy joint. Like the hand therapist splints and seroplastic casts, the digit widget applies an extension torque that stimulates the longitudinal growth of the contracted palmar soft tissues. Unlike splints, this device transmits torque directly to the skeleton, thereby avoiding pressures that prevent traditional approaches from reversing the more difficult contractures. While this device will reverse any contracture with compliant soft tissues, the surgeon must identify and reverse the cause of the force imbalance, both on the flexor and the extensor side of the joint. Without restoring balance of these forces, the joint flexion contracture will rapidly return. Let's look at some clinical problems that lend themselves to skeletal extension torque treatment. This illustration depicts an arthritic joint from a prior fracture. These stiff joints just don't glide. With the skeletal extension torque applied, after a short glide, the dorsal base of the middle phalanx digs into the proximal condyles as the palmar side of the joint opens like a book. This critically ill joint now pivots about an enlarging cartilaginous ulcer instead of its anatomic axis. Forced extension about this ulcer creates a small extensor and a large flexor tendon moment, thereby assuring a painful, stiff, and flexed joint. Please don't use skeletal extension torque for joints that can't, don't, or won't glide. Injuries to the proximal phalanx and its fibrosis tunnel may produce adhesions that limit tendon gliding and PIP extension. Clinical evaluation can help identify patients that have reversible contractures. If adhesions between the tendon and the tunnel are compliant, skeletal extension torque alone will restore distal gliding of the tendons as the torque simultaneously reverses the contracture. Rigid adhesions require surgical tendolysis combined with skeletal extension torque. With passive extension restored, the patient must have a competent active extensor or a surgical plan to create one or the contracture will rapidly return. Any clinical evidence of a compromised extensor demands patient education for their compliance with a prolonged postoperative splinting program. In the classic boutonniere deformity, the joint has an injured central slip. In these otherwise simple cases, there are three things to address. First, reverse the contracture. Next, central slip healing requires two months of continuous extension splinting to compete with the powerful flexors. Finally, palmar displacement of the lateral bands is best reversed with profundus flexion exercises of the distal joint to help restore the extensor mechanism to competence. Remember, two full months of extension splinting and distal joint flexion exercises after the joint is straight. Frequently, boutonniere lesions combine with injury to the capsular ligaments to shift the flexor tendons away from the joint's axis. This tendon subluxation increases the flexor torques that the extensor mechanism has to balance. Although this additional force imbalance favors recurrent contracture, the principles are the same. Reverse the contracture, splint for two months in extension, and teach each patient to frequently flex the distal joint to help restore a functional extensor mechanism.
Angulated proximal phalanges create impotent extensor mechanisms secondary to skeletal shortening. When fractured, the shaft of the phalanx usually shortens more on its dorsal surface. This typical apex palmar angulation creates a short skeletal length dorsally. Unlike muscle tendon units that cross most joints, the extensor mechanism's circular embrace of the MP joint prevents effective transmission of tension forces to extend the PIP joint. Although fracture site adhesions may be a problem, they are not the problem. The surgical plan must accomplish two goals. First, reverse the contracture, and then restore length and alignment to the proximal phalanx. In summary, unless you fix the skeletal deformity, reversing the contracture is doomed to failure as 100% of these joints return rather rapidly to flexion. As depicted, if a joint contracture has concomitant extensor tendon adhesions, these adhesions frequently evolve into rigid scar. Remember that contracture reversal must be combined with lysis of these adhesions for restoration of active extension. Suspect these hard to detect adhesions when recurrent flexion occurs and is not otherwise explained. When compliant, they may reverse when splinting is combined with distal joint flexion exercises. Rigid adhesions require surgical division. Dupuytren's disease is a common cause of PIP contractures and it is frequently the most difficult to treat. The minimal surgical trauma of skeletal extension torque contrasts sharply with that created by open surgical release. Extension using skeletal torque simultaneously helps solve the problem of short palmar skin. Skeletal torque can reverse the contracture prior to surgical excision of the involved fascia. For a single stage procedure, the device can be installed on the finger concomitant with excision of the diseased tissue. Post-op, skeletal extension torque is added gradually as the palmar wounds heal. Extension torque, not surgery, should be used to re reverse the so-called volar plate contracture. Prolonged extension splinting and distal joint flexion exercises are frequently required to restore a competent extensor to these joints. The AG Digit Widget arrives at your hospital or surgery center packaged in two separate trays inside the shelf box. Inside the box, you will find a nurse's information card that describes the flow of the surgery and informs the operating room staff what additional items are needed for the case. Under this card is a bag that contains a device registration form and lot number identification labels. The uppermost tray contains sterile pack A. Pack A contains everything needed to install the digit widget on the patient's finger. Under sterile pack A, you will find non-sterile pack B. Pack B contains the components needed to initiate the extension torque. Under Pack B is a complete non-sterile surgeon's manual that can be referenced prior to the case and a booklet that discusses PIP contracture etiology and patient selection. Remove the Tyvek lids from Pack A. Under the Tyvek lid of the inner tray is a sterile condensed surgical guide that can be referenced by the doctor or nurses in the sterile field. This condensed surgical guide contains step-by-step -step instructions for the bone pin and pin block installation. Inside the tray there are two pre-drills, the distal and proximal pre-drill, two bone pins, the distal and proximal pin, a hex wrench, the drill guide, and the pin block. Select the drill guide and place it on the middle phalanx of the involved finger with the word distal oriented towards the fingernail. Use fluoroscopy to confirm the proximal pin will be placed just distal to the articular cartilage of the PIP joint. Mark the skin at the proximal end of the guide. Select the proximal pre-drill. 
Prior to drilling, take care to center the drill guide on the dorsum of the finger so the drill will follow an axis that projects parallel to the proximal phalanx. Then, using a power drill, insert the proximal pre-drill through both cortices of the middle phalanx. The surgeon must securely hold the drill guide on the finger during drilling. Disengage the chuck from the pre-drill. Do not remove the pre-drill from the bone. Use fluoroscopy to confirm that the proximal pre-drill is placed correctly. Next, select the distal pre-drill. There are three fine lines etched on the distal pre-drill that indicate the maximum depth to place it into the drill chuck. Ensure these lines are visible after chucking. Securely holding the drill guide, use a power drill to insert the distal pre-drill through both cortices of the middle phalanx. Remove the distal pre-drill from the bone, but take care to maintain alignment of the drill guide with the pre-drilled hole. Now select the distal bone pin. This pin is the shorter of the two pins and has finer threads and has the word distal printed on the top of the black knob. Manually insert the distal pin into the pre-drilled hole. It should extend through but not beyond the palmar cortex of the middle phalanx. Remove the proximal pre-drill and select the proximal bone pin. It is longer, has coarser threads, and has the word proximal printed on the black knob. Insert the proximal pin into the pre-drilled hole so that it extends through but not beyond the palmar cortex of the middle phalanx. Confirm correct pin location and depth using fluoroscopy. If needed, make adjustments to pin depth prior to cutting off the knobs. Once satisfied with pin depth and location, make initial cuts just below the pin's shoulder to allow for drill guide removal. The pins will be trimmed to final length after the pin block is installed. Now select the pin block and hex wrench. Use the hex wrench to loosen the pin clamp screw a couple of turns. It is not necessary to completely remove the screw. Slide the pin block over the pins until it sits approximately 3 16 of an inch above the dorsum of the finger. This spacing allows for some swelling. Use the hex wrench to tighten the clamp screw onto the pins. Cut off the pins so they are flush with the top of the pin block. Under the lid of Pack B, there is a post-surgery condensed assembly guide that illustrates the installation of the cuff, connector assembly, elastic bands, and MP flexion strap. Under the assembly guide is a bag containing the band applicator tool, a patient information card that contains instructions for cuff and connector assembly removal, reassembly, the wearing of the MP flexion strap if indicated, and range of motion graphs for documenting the patient's progress. Inside the tray, you will find the connector assembly, two neoprene handcuffs, three vials of elastic bands, a hex wrench, and an MP flexion strap. If the patient has had an open procedure along with the application of the digit widget, it may be preferable to wait a few days to a week before starting the extension torque. If the digit widget was the only procedure, the torque may be started immediately. Choose the appropriately sized cuff for your patient. Each cuff fits both left and right hands. Place the cuff on the hand with the smooth side towards the skin. Position the distal edge of the cuff directly over the MP joints. Wrap the distal strap across the palm and attach near the base of the thumb at wrist level. Wrap the proximal strap across the back of the hand and through the thumb index web space. The connector assembly is then snapped onto the pin block and the Velcro tab is attached to the distal edge of the cuff over the MP joint of the involved finger. The extension torque is created when an elastic band is placed on the posts. One post is located on the pin block and the other on the connector assembly. In general, start with a single lightweight band that the patient wears continuously. If after a week or so, joint extension is not improving with a single lightweight band and the finger is not painful or excessively swollen, change to a medium or heavyweight band. 
an extension gain of 10 to 20 degrees per week is desirable. Monitoring range of motion by measurements and graphing the changes, along with notes about band strength and the hours the device is worn, help in the decision-making process. Pin care and flexion exercises are best performed with the extension torque removed. Detaching the connector assembly from the cuff or removal of the elastic band both remove the extension torque. For showering or washing the hand, the connector assembly can be removed from the pin block entirely by stabilizing the pin block with one hand and pivoting the connector assembly distally. If the patient is to be performing flexion exercises, it is best that the extension torque be removed so that they are not exercising against resistance. Keeping the hand clean and dry should help prevent pin track problems. To remove the digit widget, use the hex wrench from pack B to loosen the pin clamp screw on the pin block. Slide the pin block off of the pins. Grasp the pins with a needle holder or similar tool and unscrew them from the bone. Protect the pin holes with a small dressing and splint until healed. If the PIP joint needs to be held in full extension for several weeks following device removal, a small plaster cast is ideal for this purpose. Otherwise, a removable splint that is worn as needed should be prescribed for the patient. These splints may need to be worn for several months. DIP flexion exercises performed with a PIP joint held in extension will help rebalance the extensor mechanism. All flexion exercises should be performed actively. Passive or forced flexion of the PIP joints may damage the central slip and prevent it from regaining its full potential for active extension. In conclusion, this device is an excellent way to reverse a PIP contracture. The real issue is that it has to be combined with a clinical analysis and surgical plan that has the best opportunity to rebalance the forces that have resulted in the contracture, with particular attention to making certain there is a competent extensor mechanism in the joint. Otherwise, you're going to have a recurrent contracture of the joint when the device is removed. Thank you.